Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Lord's house. We're glad to have you on this Sunday morning. And for those of you who are watching us on Facebook Live, we're very happy to have you as well. I want to make sure that everyone knows that on Sundays, we provide a bulletin via our website, via also our Facebook page, and you can download it for those of you who are at home and still in front of a a computer or a, a smartphone, whatever the case might be, you can download this to have more information about what's going on in the life of our church. One thing that I want to make everyone aware of is that we now have a new online directory. It is password protected, so your information is secure and only available for people who are on the directory, people who are a part of the directory. So Sarah sent out an email early last week to give you information about how you can get on there. So pay attention to that. And uh, it's a new resource. It's a good way for us to be able to connect better with one another. And there's even a place for you to put your picture there. So we can have, uh, you know, it's a form of a pictorial directory. So pick out a good picture of yourself, uh, a nice big smile. You can even put a picture of yourself from 10 or 15 years ago if you want to, so long as you're still recognizable in your current, in your current state. Well, we are glad you're here. And read the information in the bulletin. Of course, we have prayer times that are offered that we talk about frequently Monday evenings and uh, at 6.30 and Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. And then we have a couple of Bible study classes this week. One is on Tuesday night at 7. That is the class that I teach. And then Lee Colony teaches a class on Thursday evening at 7 o'clock. So if you'd like to be a part of a Bible study group, you can do that. Or one other option is... On Sunday morning, we have a 9 o'clock Bible study that's led by Shelby Alcott and Robin Russell. So if you want to attend Bible study remotely on a Sunday morning, you can still do that. Well, I hope you feel like it's a good day to be in the Lord's house. I really do today, and I hope you do as well. Let's stand together now as we begin our time of worship with song. Come, now is the time to worship. Indeed it is. Let's stand and uh, worship the Lord. i 
would you please bow your heads with me? Father, we are so grateful again to be in this place of worship, Lord. And I thank you that this weekend we are celebrating our independence, Lord. That we are celebrating the fact that we have the freedom to come to this place to worship you and to lift your name high. Lord, we are so um, blessed by the many things that we have in this country. And Lord, I just am, again, so thankful. There's just no words for what you have given to us. Lord, I just am, pray for the families that have loved ones that are serving, Lord, that are away from them, that are across the world, Lord, that you would be with those families and you would lift them up as they are missing their loved ones for those who are serving our country. Lord, we have so much going on in this life, so much turmoil and unrest. And Father, even with that, Lord, we have your faithfulness always. It's something that will never go away, just like your love. And Father, I just want to give this time to you, Lord, that we lift your name high and that we are looking at you not people on the stage, not people in the crowd. Lord, that we are giving our whole heart to you right now. Lord, just continue to be with us in this place. Be with Pastor Keith as he comes shortly to share your word. And may all that we offer you be a blessing to your heart. In your name I pray.
Amen. Bless the Lord. Bless his holy name. Thank you, worship leaders, for doing such a splendid job in helping us to worship this morning. Take your Bibles, please, and open them to the 24th chapter of Genesis. Genesis chapter 24. Yesterday I noted on Facebook that I had some story to tell you. And uh, I don't know if that worked as a teaser or not, but the story I'm going to tell you today is the one that's contained in chapter 24. It's a text that I've never preached before. It's new material for me. Not that I didn't know about it. I mean, I was aware of it, but 
Never was I uh, so in touch with the twists and turns and the significance of the story. We're going to read just a couple of passages. Actually, we it wouldn't hurt to read the whole chapter, but it's a long chapter and we won't do that. We're going to look at verses 1 to 9 and then 61 to 67, and I will try to fill in the gaps after that. This is Genesis chapter 24 now, beginning in verse 1. Abraham was old, getting on in years, and the Lord blessed him in everything. Abraham said to his servant, the elder of his household, who managed all that he owned, <coughs> place your hand under my thigh, and I will have you swear by the Lord God of heaven and the God of earth that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I live. I will go to my land and my family and take a wife for my son, <coughs> pardon me, Isaac. The servant said to him, suppose the woman is unwilling to follow me to this land. Should I have your son go back to the land you came from? Abraham answered him, make sure that you don't take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my family's house and from my native land, who spoke to me and swore to me, I will give you this land to your, I will give this land to your offspring. He will send his angel before you. and You can take a wife for my son from there. If the woman is unwilling to follow you, then you're free from your oath to me. But don't let my son go back there. We'll say more about that in a, in a little while. So the servant placed his hand under his master's thigh. <clears throat> we'll say more about that too. And swore an oath to him concerning this matter. <clears throat> now skip down to the end of the chapter. Verses 61 to 67. Then Rebekah and her female servants got up, mounted the camels, and followed the man. So the servant took Rebekah and left. Now Isaac was returning from Bir Laharoi, where he had been living in the Negev region. In the early evening, Isaac went out to walk in the field, and looking up, he saw camels coming. Rebekah looked up, and when she saw Isaac, she got down from her camel and asked the servant, Who is the man in the field coming to meet us? The servant answered, It is my master. She took her veil and covered herself. Then the servant told Isaac everything he had done. <clears throat> and Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother, Sarah, and took Rebekah to be his wife. Isaac loved her, and he was comforted after his mother's death. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's bow our heads together. <clears throat> God, we pray now that in these moments as we think about your word, that you will bring it to life for us. God, help me this morning to tell this story well so that we can appreciate it all these many centuries after it was written and certainly after the circumstances of the story. There have been so many implications from it, implications that have meaning for us. And God, this story tells some very important things about your guidance and your leadership among us. Thank you, God, for this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope that you'll have your Bibles open to Genesis 24 because I am going to try to fill in the blanks. I want to encourage you, if you haven't already, to read the entire chapter for yourself. Now, don't do it now. I post these things on Saturday evening so that you can have an opportunity to be a little bit better prepared. But it is quite a story, and you may be surprised at some of the things going on in the background. We'll talk about those things. 
1988, a man by the name of Alan Neely joined the faculty at Princeton Seminary. At a reception that was given to welcome him, he marveled at the, uh, at the openness to diversity amongst the faculty represented there, that, that they would call someone like him with his particular background to teach at that institution. There were several people who were scheduled to make comments in response, and one of his colleagues got up and said something along these lines. He mentioned that just that fall, his daughter had left for college in Atlanta. And before she got away, he gave her a little bit of advice on romance. You see, many people fall in love with a future mate during schooling years. I don't know what the percentages are, but they're, they're actually pretty high. You meet people when you go off to school. So she was headed off, and he wanted to give her a little bit of advice on the possibilities of falling in love. He told her that while he certainly preferred a Christian son-in-law, a young man from any of the major faith groups of the world would be welcome at their house, provided that these two loved one another. He only asked her to do one thing. He said, whatever you do, don't come home with a Southern Baptist. <laughs> whatever you do, anybody else. Now, he was kidding, I think, when he said that. But I want you to know that Abraham felt the same way about the Canaanites. Maybe you picked that up in the verses we read just a moment ago. He's now living amongst these Canaanites, and he does not want his son to take a wife from amongst them. And it was a real matter of urgency that Isaac have a wife lest the promise that God had made to Abraham earlier that he was going to make him the father of a great nation, if that was to be a success, if that promise was to have a future, then Isaac needed to have a mate. Now there are some scholars who will argue that this is what seems to be a very peculiar way of finding a spouse has some cultural elements to it. I mean, we all have heard about arranged marriages and things like that. We, we, we recognize that. There are some elements of culture here, but there are others who suggest that <clears throat> the earliest readers or hearers of this story would have shaken their heads and at least smiled about the humor in the story itself. Isaac is very much associated with humor. Maybe you know that. From the first indication of his birth, people were laughing. Abraham laughed, and Sarah laughed as well. Do you remember that? But she wasn't willing to admit that she had laughed. I think that she may have been like a lot of people who have a, uh, a mistaken reverence sometimes for the scriptures to the extent that they think that they shouldn't ever laugh about anything in the Bible. But I want you to know that while it may be a little bit difficult to find at times because everything in the scriptures is translated either from Hebrew or the Greek language, even though it may be a little difficult to see also because of the vast cultural differences that we have uh, with those people, the New and Old Testaments have some literary playfulness about them. And such is the case in our text. There are elements of comedy, believe it or not, 
that can be found throughout the stories of Isaac. And there really is less information about Isaac, and there's less of a story about Isaac than any of the other patriarchs. In fact, Rebekah gets a whole lot more ink than Isaac in Genesis. Sarah was, in fact, strangely prophetic in something that she said. You might want to write down this notation. It's Genesis chapter 2, verse 16. When Isaac was born, she said, God has made laughter for me. <coughs> Do you remember her saying that? Sounds like an unusual thing to say at the birth of a child. God has made laughter for me, and all who hear will laugh with me. That's Genesis 24, excuse me, Genesis 21, 6. There's actually a little bit of a play on the words there. The root Hebrew word for Isaac's name is very close to the root Hebrew word for the verb, he laughs. Maybe you didn't know that. It's there. It's right there in the text. And so with Rebecca's statement, she is, it's, it's a bit of a pun. God has made laughter for me, referring specifically to Isaac. Now, what was the joke in all of this? Well, that little baby represented the absurdity of the way in which God sometimes does things in this world. Uh, hopefully, if, if you have some experience with Sunday school or you've, you've been involved in a church like this for some time, you know that Abraham and Sarah were well beyond the years of giving birth. That's what they both laughed about. Sarah, you're going to have a baby. And she's, she's overhearing this conversation, actually. And she laughs. Who can blame her for that? Well, I assure you that if you pay close attention this morning to this wonderful story, then you can learn some things about a simple trust and confidence in God, even in the midst of very high stake circumstances like we have here in the text, this beautiful story the, uh, of Eliezer, his matchmaking for Isaac, high stakes circumstances, and you know, we're dealing with some high stakes circumstances as well these days, aren't we? Some things that require faith on our part as we move forward. And so in the text before us, we need to pay careful attention in a seemingly natural sequence of affairs, God was at work in ways like no one could have imagined at the time. And maybe you've had that same experience in life as well. Well, let's get to the story. And it divides very nicely into four different scenes. Now, we're going to flash those up there on the screen for you. But what I want to do is, in the interest of time, I want to just go ahead and pick up with scene one and say something about it. <coughs> scene one involves Abraham and his servant, Eliezer. Now, Eliezer is never named in chapter 24, but heretofore he is named as Abraham's uh, right-hand man, so to speak. In Abraham, in this passage that I read a moment ago, he, Abraham is portrayed as an intensely determined and utterly believing kind of guy. He is wonderfully confident in the ability of Eleazar to bring back a suitable 
and well-credentialed, I should say, wife for his son. Abraham, and by the way, these words that we have here in chapter 24 are the very last words from Abraham. Abraham's very old, and he's not going to be around much longer. In fact, in the chapter before, his wife has just passed away, and he has made arrangements for a grave for her. So that's just happened in uh, the previous chapter. He essentially is getting his affairs in order. And one of the things on that list is the finding of this bride. And so he's, he, he's so full of faith in these last words that he speaks. Something you might want to do this afternoon or sometime this week in a personal Bible study is go back in Genesis. I think it's back to like chapter 15. Go back and look at some of Abraham's first words and compare them with his last words that we have here. Now what you'll find is that he has grown a great deal in his faith. He has come a long way through a lot of circumstances. Initially, he's questioning and he's doubtful and he wonders how all of this stuff can happen that God seems to be calling forth. But here in this chapter, he's so full of confidence. But even so, he makes Eleazar swear to bring home, to, to never bring home, I should say, a candidate from amongst the daughters of the Canaanites. Now, ever so briefly, because it's parenthetical, but I, I mentioned I'd say something about it. It seems kind of odd to put your hand under somebody else's thigh when you're swearing. Does that, Tom, does that seem odd to you? That, that's almost weird, isn't it? But um, actually, in, in the Hebrew culture, your loins are the source of your procreation, all right? So there, let me just say there's a connection there. And Abraham is concerned that he's going to pass away even before Eleazar completes this responsibility. So he says, man, you got to swear. you got to swear to me that, you know, even if this little trip that we're planning is not successful, you're not to bring home a daughter of the Canaanites. He insists further that, uh, <laughs> that he, you know, should never turn the job over to Isaac. I mean, did you catch that? He said, you know what? If, if you go and the woman doesn't want to come back with you, then you're free from the oath. But don't let Isaac go back. Now, he doesn't have any confidence at all in Isaac, who at this point is 40 years old. He doesn't have any confidence in him to make this selection. Let's go to scene two. In scene two, they have arrived in Haran, H-A-R-A-N. It's about a month-long journey. We don't have any details about the journey. But Eleazar does something smart. He stops at the watering hole that is just outside of the city a kind of public well. It's where people would have gathered uh, for, you know, drawing water, of course. And I get the impression, and, and he's not the only one that did this. Uh, Moses did it uh, when he went and <clears throat> met his future wife. But uh, it's interesting that they're drawing water in the evening. I guess they Maybe wait till it cools off a little bit and they get water for the next day. I'm not, I'm not sure at all how this works. But if you have ever hauled water, you know, try, try taking one of these plastic five-gallon buckets and fill it up with five gallons of water and see how heavy it is. It's a tough deal. But these young women are coming in the evening to gather water for their families. Now... In this second part, Eleazar 
offers up a quick prayer that the following is going to happen. Let me just see if I can tell you how it works. Do you remember when, uh, when you had romantic interests back in junior high? Anybody when you're 12, 13, 14 years old? Now, I'm sure you didn't do this, but I'm sure you knew some young lady or young man, and I, a young man wouldn't admit it, a young lady might, pray something like this. If so-and-so speaks to me tomorrow, then I will know that he likes me. Do you remember anything like that? Those kinds of prayers, you know. Or if, if, <clears throat> if she smiles at me today, Lord, let that be a sign that she's my future wife. I, want, I love her that much, you know. I'm 13, 14 years old. Come on, didn't you have those kinds of experiences? Nod your head like this if you did. I mean, good Lord. Uh, or maybe you've made a phone call like this before. You're calling somebody and you really don't want to call them, but you're obliged to for whatever reason. And you dial the number and you hear it ringing and you say a quick prayer like this. Oh, Lord, please let it go to voicemail. Anybody, anybody ever done that before? That's the kind of prayer that Eleazar offers up. He says, Lord, let the woman who offers me a drink and let the woman who goes a step further to provide water for these dozen camels that I have that are a part of this caravan. We're carrying all this precious stuff, you know, to give away to somebody. Let that Woman, oh Lord, let that woman be the one. And so the very first woman who offers him water, she not only does that, she offers those 12 camels water as well. And right away, Eleazar says to himself, we've got a winner, ladies and gentlemen. And his, his prayer is not even completed when she offers him a drink of water. And when she wants to water the camels, she's beautiful. She is pure. She is, uh, she is related to Abraham's family, by the way. She is energetic, and she has a take-charge kind of spirit. Look at verses 16 to 20 and, and follow, just follow the verbs. Now the girl was very beautiful, a virgin. No man had been intimate with her. She went down to the spring. She filled up her jug. She came up. Then the servant ran to meet her. Please let me have a little water from your jug. She replied, drink, my Lord. She quickly lowered her jug and her left hand and gave him, her, her hand and gave him a drink. And when she finished giving him a drink, she said, I'll also draw water for your camels. I mean, she does, she does, she does, she does. I mean, this is a remarkable specimen. This is, in Eliezer's mind, this is the blessings of heaven packaged in an earthly woman. Now, with respect to that little prayer, that Eleazar offers to the Lord. Uh, one commentator mentions about the prayer that the content of the prayer is not part of the traditional vocabulary of piety in the Old Testament. In other words, it's not a very religious prayer. It's not a very uh, 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 deeply uh, meaningful, intimate communication with God. It's sort of a flash prayer, so to speak. Don't anticipate the prayer of Eleazar coming out as a companion volume anytime soon to your little book, The Prayer of Jabez. Remember when that came out a few years ago? There won't ever be a book called The Prayer of Eleazar because it's really just simple, straightforward, and it's probably coming 
from somebody who, who didn't necessarily know the Lord. He says, he, he prays to the, to the, he calls out to the God of his master, Abraham. So she's beautiful. She is everything he can possibly imagine because he recognized that Abraham was going to need a wife who was able to do more than just what was required. In fact, she would not be the last wife ever called upon to perform the role of a mother as well as a wife. That's happened a few times in this world of ours, hasn't it? Let's quickly go to scene three, where we get now to meet Rebecca's older brother, Laban. Do you remember Laban from uh, the Genesis account? If you do, you remember Laban with some dealings with, with Jacob, you know, one of the offspring of, uh, of Isaac and Rebecca later on. But uh, Laban is an operator if one ever existed. I mean, he is a smooth operator. He eyes, he lays eyes on these camels. And some of the reading I did, it said that to have one camel was a sign of wealth back in the day. And so here you've got a dozen camels. I mean, it's like a, an entourage of a dozen Mercedes-Benz limousines pulling up uh, nearby. I mean, Rebecca runs all the way back to the house. I mean, this is, a, this is exciting stuff. Laban comes, he lays his eyes on those camels, and also he sees the jewelry that has been bestowed upon his sister, and Laban quickly gets religion in a big way. I mean, it's like, hey, whatever you want, friend, we've got it. You need more water for those camels? How about a little bit of straw? And we're going to open our home up to you in a, uh, in a big way. What is ours will be yours. He might have been something of a huckster and not a true believer at this point, but neither was he a fool. I mean, he looked carefully. Laban and the rest of the family, very accommodating. In the midst of the conversation, Eliezer pops the question. Namely, can Rebecca go back with me to Canaan to become the wife of Isaac, the son of my Lord, the son of my master? Now, uh, there have been lots of gifts lavished upon the family of Rebecca. I mean, things are, things are looking pretty good. You know, Eleazar is wanting to soften the blow, I suppose, of taking this marvelous creature, this marvelous human being. He says, hey, let me, you know, the reason we've got these 12 camels, they're loaded down with jewels and money and all sorts of stuff. So Laban's more than happy to do business. In fact, the father of Rebecca plays a very limited role. Mostly it's Laban. All right? Now, everything seems good to go. The family has said, you know what? It sounds to me like the Lord is in this. But then there's a snag in verse 55. You can look at it a little bit later. There's a snag. Um, well, I don't know. Let's look at it right now. Verse 55, but her brother Laban and her mother said, let the girl stay with us for about 10 days. We need to, we need to think about this. Now, I have a suspicion that Laban was wanting to see if the pot could be sweetened a little bit if they held out a little bit longer. What do you think about that? You know, just knowing what you know about Laban. Eh, let's don't go back quite yet. And then Laban says, let's ask Rebecca. And I have the impression that he is fully expecting Rebecca to go along with the rest of the family and say, yeah, give us about 10 more 
days. And Rebecca says, I want to go. And that settles the question. So here they go with their lightened camel train back home. Now they, Rebecca takes along some servants and, you know, she has to carry a few things herself. Quickly, scene four, this is the finale. Now, if you haven't seen anything humorous yet, if you're going to see something humorous, you may see it, you may see it here. I want you to imagine a Hollywood finish to this story. It's a, it's a beautiful romance, isn't it? I want you to imagine a split screen with Rebecca arriving and Isaac in the pasture seeing some dust kicked up on the distant horizon, recognizing that this camel train is on the way. You may not believe this, but there's a big question as to what exactly Isaac was doing in that field. I have two articles <laughs> that I read this past week on the mysterious Hebrew word that shows up in the text. Do you know that many people believe that Isaac in that field, he was not meditating, he was not mourning over the death of his mom, even though it's been a long time now, he wasn't doing that. The Hebrew word suggests that he may have been relieving himself. Do you get it? You see that? Not very romantic, is it? And then the text uses a verb to talk about Rebecca quickly getting off of her camel. You know what that verb suggests? It suggests that she falls off the camel upon, upon, upon seeing this set of circumstances. Now, I don't know, maybe the Hebrew scholars are wrong, but I happen to think based upon Isaac, based upon who he was, such a needy kind of a guy that this kind of thing may have indeed happened. Well, that's not the kind of ending necessarily that you would expect. I mean, it's, uh, you know, you don't get a second chance at a first impression, do you? I mean, I've, I've heard that many, many times. But she does dismount, and Isaac does leave that field, and all's well that ends well, they are married, and subsequently they fall in love. They're married, and then they fall in love, and they enter his mother's old tent to consummate the union. Now, for a reader in the ancient world, an eye roll would at least have been in order with that last little piece of information. Lord, he doesn't seem to be able to get over this connection that he had with his mother, for goodness sakes. Now, what does a story like this suggest to you and me? There's two or three very basic things that I want you to see before we wrap this up. The first is that some of God's most amazing gifts, his most consequential guidance in our lives, we do not recognize in the moment that it occurs. Do we? Think about that for a minute. I want you to know that this story all week long has had me thinking about when I first met Laura. Now, she, we didn't meet under those kinds of embarrassing circumstances that I'm describing here, much better circumstances. But little did I have any idea 
I didn't have any idea when I first asked her for a date. I was 16. She was 15. We were very young. We went to see some Robert Redford movie. I don't know what it was. Laura could tell you. She was, wait a minute, what was it? Anyway, it was really good. But man, I had no idea how God was at work in those circumstances. Because not just anybody can be the spouse of a pastor. It's a very, very tough job. Some of God's most amazing gifts, some of his most consequential guidance are not recognized in the moment that they happen. They are best seen in the, in the rear view mirror. When we go back and we contemplate and we look over our lives, those of us who are believers, those of us who entrust our lives to God's guidance, when we look back over our shoulders, we can see God's handiwork all over the place. God preventing us from some decision that we just had our hearts set on, perhaps. And God providing us with remarkable gifts and blessing and leadership. The second thing I want you to see is that the workings of God are not always spectacular. Did you notice in the story that the only mention of some kind of divine intervention or involvement in any way in these circumstances was when poor old Abraham said, the, uh, uh, an angel of the Lord will guide you in your work. I mean, Eleazar wasn't a spiritual kind of guy. He didn't say, you know, God, please have a, a dove light upon the head of the woman who will be the wife of Rebekah. And even better, God, announce it from, from the heavens so that there's no mistake. There wasn't anything remarkable or supernatural about all of this from a human perspective. A seemingly natural sequence of events where, where you and I simply move according to our best wits and according to our faith in God, these kinds of circumstances are remarkable opportunities for God to work in our lives. God gave us brains and expects us to use them. God gave us good sense. God God allows us to be around people who are wise to help us to make these decisions. When Eleazar prayed, he was, he was simply praying that the exercise of his discretion in making this choice would be in God's will. God, I'm acting according to my best wits. I'm doing the best I can based upon the information that I have to move forward in this circumstance. I pray that it's in your will. Now one more thing is this. God doesn't require greatness and human genius to accomplish his purposes. Aren't you glad about that? Wouldn't you be in trouble if the requirement was genius? You know, you got to be a part of the Mensa organization, you know, those folks that have a genius IQ. You're not going to run into people around here. You won't be running into them at a Mensa meeting anytime soon. I assure you of that. It's not going to happen. We're just common folks doing the best that we can to live lives in accordance with God's purposes. And you know what? God can do great and mighty things through those kinds of people. In fact, the last thing I want to say as our time is running short, I knew I might go a little long this morning. God often fulfills his plans by making a mockery of human expectations and plans. You know, sometimes God does things in such an unusual way that it's something that we never could have imagined. 
And you know, even though, uh, you know, Isaac was a little bit short on good sense at times, and you know, and even though these 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 patriarchs were far from being perfect human beings, God did miraculous things through them. And do you know what the most unusual, the most absurd, the most ridiculous thing is in the scriptures about how God works? You want to know what it is? It's the cross of Jesus Christ. Paul called it the foolishness of the cross. I mean, who could imagine that the God of the universe would come in human as a human being in the person of Jesus and that Jesus would teach and help people to understand the nature of God but but his message would be rejected he would be executed cruelly on a cross and it would seem as though hope in Jesus was lost but then praise God he would rise from God would raise him from the dead on that Sunday morning and provide for you and me the offer of salvation. That's an absurd story. That's a ridiculous story. That's why Paul called it the foolishness of the cross. And Paul spoke of it as a stumbling block for a lot of people because it seemed so utterly ridiculous. But it was true. Now, some of you under the sound of my voice today Maybe you've never come to a point in your life where you have grasped hold of or accepted the wonderful gift of salvation freely offered in what the Lord Jesus has provided through his death on the cross and through his resurrection. Maybe you've never come to that point in your life to where you acknowledge your sinfulness and your need for a Savior. Someone who will, who will forgive you of that sin that, 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 puts, that creates a chasm between you and God. Oh, I want you to know that even though it's, it's something that is Bizarre from a human point of view, the New Testament tells us very beautifully that what Jesus accomplished provided the gift of salvation for the likes of you and me, regardless of where you find yourself this morning. God, we pray that in these moments of reflection upon this text, that you will help us to remember that you'll help us to remember in our personal lives, God, that as we seek your will, as we seek to use our minds and the desires that you've placed in our hearts to the best extent possible, as we seek to do that, God, help us to know, based on the goodness that, you see, that we see in your lives in the rearview mirror as we look over our lives and we think about the ways in which you have provided in remarkable ways. May we be informed by that same faith as we move ahead through difficult circumstances. And may, may that kind of informed faith help us as a congregation as we move through uncharted territory oh Lord how many times have we heard that terminology over the last four months but God it is uncharted and we do need your direction and God help us to lean on the reality that you have a task for our church to fulfill and you haven't called us here by accident you haven't provided us with this wonderful tool without the intention of our church being a lighthouse for the gospel. We pray, God, that it would be so. Now, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want to encourage you about a couple of things. First of all, if, you, if you're if you interested and want to know more about this whole matter of salvation, I want you to contact me this week at 
or even today, area code 414-425-1616. That's the number here at the office. You can leave a message for me. It'll just be between you and me. And if there's something that, if you'd like to know more about what it means to be a child of God, I would be so happy to share that with you. And if there's people out there who are struggling with the mat, with the, the whole matter of, of God's leadership, God's guidance, and God's will over some a uh, particular difficulty that you're going through. If I can be of help to you in any way, you call that number as well. God, we pray that the people here this morning will take to heart the message of the text today. Though it's not explicit, it certainly is implicit. We can see it. May we see it even more clearly as we pay attention to it again in our own reading. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for your good listening this morning. I apologize that I've gone a little longer than I wanted to. I was afraid it would take a while to tell this great story, but thank you for your patience, those of you who are online. I hope you feel that it's been worth the extra 10 minutes. We're glad that you're here, and I hope you'll come back next week. And I hope also that you'll avail yourself to one of our Bible study opportunities, one of our you know, prayer opportunities, whatever the case might be. Now here in the congregation, let's stand together and let's sing as we're being dismissed from the Lord's house.